Welcome to the Garage Apartment Sports and Entertainment with your favorite partner's favorite partners. I am the funky militant Hadar Jones. And as always, I have the tribe with me. So go ahead and introduce yourself, let the people know who you are. B Mac back from better than ever. And a mod day here, live and on location from the Ukraine. <laughs> or... <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And as always, in a please, bunker. please follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out our website, the garage apt. Dot com got some awesome things on there. We got interviews, we have clips, we have uh, uh, articles, articles. And, and many other many things. Other things. So be sure to be check, sure that, to check out. that out. Also, also make sure, make you, sure hit you hit a like, hit a like on our on YouTube, YouTube page, page and on our Facebook page, page, page and all of our social media. So, so very, 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 very excited. excited. We have a bit of, a, a bit of uh, American sports royalty. So us. we I'm have with us. The first person to ever repeat as back-to-back 100 meters champion. She has long been a champion for women's equality in sports. Um, former world record holder in the 64 and 68 Olympics, Miss Wyoming Tyus. Welcome to the garage apartment, Miss Wyoming. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So now, again, there's so many things that we can talk about, so many things we can start with. Uh, I know that the, 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 the fellas and I have a thousand questions. But first, I just want to ask you, because you have, again, like I said, you have long since been a champion for equality for women in sports. But in my opinion, I feel like it's too uh, much of it is unbeknownst to many. Uh, do you... So I view you as a unsung shero, if okay. you will. I'll do you know, <laughs> do you do you ever feel that way? Well, no. I mean, you know what I do or what how I think and when I speak on what I feel and and talk about uh, equal rights and human rights and all of that. I I think we all should be in that line of fire talking about that. And uh, you know, growing up in the South, I got a good education on. Uh, uh, segregation and, and all those kinds of things. So uh, also growing up with three older brothers, I learned to stay in the fight for a long time, <laughs> for all, you know, be fight for what you believe in, fight for whatever it is, whatever you're going to do. So that's where I come from. I just think that, uh, you know, each person have to find their own. And uh, one thing I always say is we, all of us are not always on the same page. So sometimes you have to wait, uh, and you know, so you have to coach or you have to inspire other people. And uh, hopefully the things that I say and I have done have inspired other people to look at uh, where we are in this world today. So, I mean, let's talk about your origins, because I know that you played multiple sports. And then, of course, this was at a time when uh, women's sports was not uh, nearly as popular as it is now. And then many would say it's still not as popular as it should be. Mm -hmm. um, so how did you get into how did you begin running track? Oh, that started when I was a little kid. I mean, I, as I stated before, I grew up with three older brothers, so. I used to run to keep up with them, run to uh, run away for the fights and all those kinds of things. So I've always been very active. Uh, we, I grew up on a dairy farm and on a dairy farm, I, we didn't own the farm. My dad worked the farm. So we, uh, our goals, I had three older brothers and what our parents always said to us was that, hey, you know, my dad always said, I have worked hard enough. I've picked enough cotton so you guys never have to work the dairy or anything like that, what you have to do is go to school. And as he would say, get your lesson. That means, you know, you have to, you know, make it in school because he felt that going to school and education would help move you from where we were. So 
but I'm growing up on a dairy farm, so and I only play, had brothers to play with, so that's all I did. So I learned to play basketball, I learned to play soccer, all baseball, all the sports for boys because it was not really girls were not encouraged to do so. To, and not only that, not only were they not encouraged, the sports weren't available. I mean, we, I ran track just because they had track there, and I played basketball. And those are the only two sports that were available for women. Or young girls, and uh, so I did that. But before that, you know, it all started on a dairy farm, playing with my brothers, playing with the people in the neighborhood. Well, we lived in a, a white neighborhood. We were the only black family living there. And uh, the man that owned the dairy farm had, what, four boys and two girls. But as black uh, people, as black Brought by my brothers and boys, they couldn't play with the girls, and the white girls couldn't play with black kids anyway. So they allowed them to do that. So we always played with the black. I always played with the boys, and uh, you know, my brothers may have. I don't think they really thought about it. Sometimes they would say, "Oh, we don't want her to on a team. We don't want her playing." And my dad would always say to them, "Hey, she's just as good, if not better, than you." And uh, and a lot of times when new people would move into the neighborhood, they had kids, they wouldn't want to play with a girl. We don't play with girls. We don't play with girls. And my brother said, well, we have to. <laughs> they can't play without me. And uh, so they would let me play. I mean, you know, I would play. I'd be on my brother's teams. And then, and, you know, they realized, hey, she's really good. And the next time we go out to play again, they were, we want her on our team. We want her. No. You didn't want me the first time. You can't give me the second time. <laughs> so, so that's pretty much how it started. You know, I always wanted to be, you know, we would, you know, my brothers could ride a, a bicycle. I wanted to ride it better. Yes. You had your so, hand up. <laughs> speaking of uh, being older brothers and playing sports, when, when did you first have your, like, first idol, somebody that you really looked up to? Uh, in your... Well, that would have to be my brothers. <laughs> I mean, they—that's who I played with. I mean, they were—they we were good. I let me just say that. <laughs> and, and you know, the people, the kids we played with, we were we were good, and we were always trying to do better, and I always wanted to be better, and uh, that's what it was. So I didn't, you know, the look as far as idolizing somebody in sports or anything like that. That. That was not a part of me as I was growing up at six, seven, eight, nine, ten, or whatever. I mean, I think once I started to get involved in sports, I started looking at things a little bit different. But I can't say I, I, I wanted to, I couldn't, I can't say to you that, hey, when I grow up, I want to be like such and such. It was never that. I, when I grew up, I just said, if when I grow up and as long as I'm playing, I just want to be good. I just want to be able to play. I just, you know, I want to be on a team. I said, I mean, I, I don't have to be the best person on a team, but I want to be a part of the team. And that's, that was me. So, so speaking of being a part of a team, you actually were a part of something pretty historical. Um, you talked about how you got in the track and then you were, of course, pretty good at it. Yeah. And then you decided to go to Tennessee State and become a Tiger Bell. Yes. Did you see my shirt? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so when you <laughs> when you decided to go there, did you know that you were or did you believe that you would compete internationally? No. Well, when I, you know, just growing, I grew up in a small town, a town that uh, Griffin, Georgia, and I grew up in the rural part of Griffin, Georgia, and schools were not integrated, so we went to segregated schools. So, you know, I we only activities they had like when I was in elementary school for for girls was that we would have May Day, so you have May Day, you have your little sack races, they, they had Maypole planning and all of that, and. All, and all I wanted to do when the boys were out on the field playing football, I wanted to be out there playing because that's what I did at home. And the teachers were like, no, girls don't do that. You can't do that. And not only, you know, they always say you have to wear a dress and all that. And I wore pants all the time. And my, you know, to the point where the teachers had said to my mom, hey, can she ever have a dress? She needs to wear dresses. And, and I was like, uh, that's not happening. And my dad says, oh, well, we can fix this. 
you can wear a dress, just put your pants on underneath the dress and you can go and do what you usually do. So there was a remedy for it. But, uh, you know, at the time when I went off to Tennessee State, or even when I was running in high school, you know, we only had meets, little small meets, and I could beat some of the people. But the girl that was beating me all the time, it was in my time. Uh, we were the same school. We, we went at high school together, and she was much better than me. She would beat me every time we went out. But uh, she didn't stick with it. I did. So, and I got an opportunity from. Uh, uh, Mr. Temple, which we call him at Temple, he was a coach at Tennessee State, and he was like a um, football coach, so to speak. He would go to different places, states like Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, and he would go to major track meets that were half for girls. And we're talking about black girls when I'm talking about anybody else. This is what we're talking about. And uh, they would, um, he would scout and see what you look like and all that. And he saw me running at a track meet in Fort Valley, Georgia, at Fort Valley State College. <laughs> so he saw me running and uh, he came up to me and introduced himself. He says, uh, he always called people by their last name. He was like, Tyus. I said, yes, uh, I'm uh, Coach Temple. I'm to coach at Tennessee State. Uh, you look pretty good out there. We think you can do better if you know you get some more training. And then he said, uh, I have a program, a summer program, and want to know if you'd be interested in coming to the summer program. I said, I think so. <laughs> I didn't know. I mean, this is all, you know, I, I'm like, I guess. He said, well, you'll be hearing from me and we'll, we'll work it out. I said, okay. And then two weeks later, I got a letter from him saying that, he was coming to Griffin, Georgia to visit me and my family. My mom, my dad had passed away. So my uh, he visited us and he wanted to talk about me coming to the camp that summer. And he did this with every girl that came there in the summer. Uh, he went to everybody's home. He talked to every parent, parent parents, grandparents, everybody, anybody. And uh, he laid, you know, he says, this is what I expect. This is my, these are my rules. Uh, as long as you're following my rules, you're fine. If you can't follow my rules, you had that little saying, uh, it's my way or the highway. <laughs> so he, you know, he, my mom and I, I was sitting on the floor and he, they were sitting on the couch and a friend of my mom's was there and they were talking and talking and he was explaining it to my mom, you know, what his uh, rules were. He had, he was no nonsense type person. And all of those things. And when he finished, he says, well, he asked me, well, you interested? I said, sounds like it. I guess I could do that. And he said, well, are you going to, would you like to come? I said, oh, sure. And then when he left, you know, it was like, it was no way for me to go. We didn't have the money. I mean, my mom, our house had burned down the year before. So it was like, we had nothing. And it was like, and my, and, oh, I'm sorry, my house, our house had burned down two years before. My dad had died the year before. And it was more like, this is not going to work. It's, we don't even have the money to send me to anywhere. So I don't even know why we were talking about it. That's what was going on in my head. But uh, my school, which is Fairmount High School, uh, raised all the $27 to send me <laughs> To, which was a lot of money in the 60s, 61, 62. You know, it was a lot of money. And it, I got a round trip ticket on the train. <laughs> and uh, I probably had a couple of dollars to spend after that. And then, uh, you know, I was, I had to be at Tennessee State on June 1st. And I took the train. You know, here it is. Young woman, young girl, getting on the train and leave. I had to. We had to drive to Atlanta, and put me on the train, and we go. And I have to be on the train for eight hours by myself. And, you know, just sitting there. And I, my mom's friend that was there with us when Mr. Temple came, she says to me, "Well, when you get on that train, you get on that train, you sit there and you sit with dignity." <laughs> and I said, "Okay." And don't talk to anybody. We didn't have to worry because, you know, of course, the trains were segregated too. We, you know, all the black people were in one car or two, uh, two of them, but that was it. So we were, we were pretty safe. But, you know, you think about to travel eight hours 
through the mountains of Tennessee, the Rockies. You know. How old were you? I was fifteen. Yeah. So, and, but never gone, never gone anywhere. Never, definitely never gone anywhere by myself. You know, you know, you know, never been out of the state of Georgia. So there we go. So it was great. I mean, I get there and Mr. Temple had said he would be there for me. And he was. He, I get off the train and he went, hi, Tyus. I said, hi, Mr. Temple. And he had a person with him. And he said, Tyus, this is Rudolph. I said, okay, hi, how are you doing? And we got our luggage and we got in and we get in the car and all that. He, he and Rudolph is Wilma Rudolph. I didn't know anything about who she was. So I can least say that. So we were driving, he's driving and they're talking. He and Wilma just talking, 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 talking. And all I could say, gosh, what have I gotten myself into? God, they talk too much. <laughs> but uh, we get to the campus and uh, he says, oh, you need to go on up. As I came in, my, I got out in about eight o'clock that night. And he was saying that uh, get a good night's sleep because you have to be at practice at five in the morning. So five in the morning, <laughs> is it? So, yep. Yeah. So, um, you know, I did that and we went into the dorms and there were other girls that were already there. They had been there the day before or the day of the day of. And um, we, you, you meet all those people. They were all talking about Wilma Rudolph, Wilma Rudolph, because she had won three gold medals in 1960. And uh, she was, oh, and I I didn't know anything about that. And I didn't, like, my knowledge of track is that I like to run and that's all it was. I didn't, you know, we had one television and when, you know, when I was growing up and what sports we watched had to be what my dad liked, which was boxing on Saturday night and baseball. So, so I didn't know anything else about any other school. You know, I knew, I knew about basketball and all those things, but we didn't watch that on television. We just knew it because it was, you know, in our school, in our school system. And so that was my... It, you know, my trip to uh, Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, that's five, five o'clock in the morning. He had to be on track. You can't be late. He never, Mr. Temple was one of those no-nonsense people. You can't be late. If you're late, then you are, you got to have to see him at the practice. So, and that started right there. So just really brief, is that when you, is that when you officially knew you were there? Like, not there, but ready, or could be that talented to run, obviously, collegiately and perhaps go on further? Or did you already know? I know you realized that you were very good, you and your brothers all together, but did you already know that you had some track talent there? No. I mean, I, I knew I could run, but, like, uh, there were, the other part of this is that the other girls from the other, pe other places, like Alabama, Mississippi, you know, and all of that, they were just as good, if not better. And I couldn't, I mean, they were beating me. So it was like, all I was there, when I think about it nowadays, I just think that I was just there to learn, to get better if I could. But after you get started getting beat so many times, you don't know if you're good enough to be there. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's like a lot of the, and the practices were hard in the summer. I mean, his practice was hard anyway, but in the summer for the young high, high school girls, when they came, you had three practices. You practice at five in the morning, you practice at nine, and then you practice at one in the afternoon. So you know Bob, anybody from the South know about that one o'clock sun <laughs> and being out there in it. But so you would, we would have those practices and you know I look back at it now and I understand why he did this because he promised every parent that you I would take care of your girls, I would send them back, they would be okay. And we were so tired because after that first practice, all you could do is almost crawl off the track track and walk to the dining hall to have breakfast and lay down until it's time to be back at practice at nine. And then the same since you get you off and you have lunch and all you can do is crawl back to eat. And, you know, so you, he had it, so you were too tired to do anything uh, other than talk. But a lot of the young girls there was not a lot, a few of them, you know, I think it was about 25 of us the first summer I was there. And within a week, maybe uh, 10 of them left. You know, they were, it was a hard practice. I wanted to leave. I, I was like, oh, I can't do this. I mean, this is just grueling. But uh, I called my mom and asked her. I said, told her, 
I would like to come home because the practices are too hard. I can't do this. This is, and I know that I'm not, I'm not winning. They're beating me all over the place. And uh, I need, you know, I have an ego here too, but they were, and he, and she says, she's listening, listening, listening. And she said, well, I'll tell you this, you can't come home because you said you wanted to do it. So you have to finish it, but you don't have to go back next year. So I was really upset by that, but I just said, okay, I got two and a half weeks to go, so I can do this. And I'm glad I did, because that's what, you know, I stuck with it. I was, you know, although I was getting beat, still was getting beat. <laughs> I've got beat the whole summer. I don't think I, you know, I don't think I finished first in anything that whole summer. So it was, but it was, you know, it was a lesson learned. It was, I mean, I grew in that year. I mean, I grew not, not just as a, you know, athlete, but as a person and learning things and experiencing things I never experienced before to be on a campus, a college campus and, you know, all these, it's just, it was just eye opening and especially coming from where I was coming from, from Griffin, Georgia and not being exposed to all those kinds of things. Did you go back next year? Of course, <laughs> I went back next year and a year afterwards. And the thing was, the uh, Mr. Temple, this is in, he was given scholarships. You got it. They said a, a scholarship. They, basically, it was work aid. So we would go in and it'd be work aid. And uh, so Tennessee State, well, Tuskegee started out doing it. That was the first school to do that, to give scholarships to women in, in track. And then it was in, in Tennessee State and then Hawaii and then Texas Southern. But in the beginning, it was just, uh, it started in the early 60s and late 50s, 60s that, you know, it was Tuskegee and then Mr. Temple was Tennessee, Tuskegee's uh, program went under. So Mr. Temple's program has flourished and, you know, he was able to uh, give all his young women that came through him and stuck it out a college education. I mean, something that, it was no way I was going to ever go to college, and my parent, my mom, couldn't pay, afford it. So I got a chance to go to get a college education and also a, a worldly education, and then I got to travel all over the world. I got to go to places that I never would have thought I would where I would go. You know, I got a chance to do all those things because I could run, and also not only could you you had to run, you also had to keep your grades up. So if you couldn't, if you can't keep your grades up, you had to go home. And so uh, I learned how to manage my time because <laughs> at first I didn't know how to do all those things. You have to learn how to manage your time as far as um, competing. And then now, so you have to uh, go out of town for a track meet. You have to come back. You have to get back into it. You have to catch up where you would left off. I mean, you have to catch up with the rest of the class, all those kinds of things. So. It was a lesson well learned, it's something that I would never, I mean, I can never forget it. It was something that uh, I would always be and grateful to Mr. Temple. And I always say to people, I don't know how Mr. Temple knew all this. How, how could he look at some young lady and say, okay, will you come to me and I can make you do, he didn't say I'll make you a star, but we, we can get you through college. We can get you to run in, it may be in Europe someplace, all those kinds of things. All you have to do is have a great attitude. So, and he would always say that everybody can't win a gold medal and everybody can't go to the Olympics. But every each person here, each one of you can always contribute and your co contribution to the team, the contribution to the school. You know, you can always do that. And he made all of us feel like, hey, we could do anything we want. And, the other part of that too, he always said that, um, you know, you may never get recognized for it. It's not, you know, you may, you may, you can win a hundred gold medals and nobody will say anything or, or recognize you or give you the accolades you're supposed to get because one, you're black, two, you're a woman, you know, so those kinds of things. So, you know, he educated us in a whole lot of different ways and uh, I would never, you know, I'll never forget that. And I think about all the girls. You know, he, he put 40 girls on the Olympic team. And out of 40 girls on the Olympic team, they won 23 medals. 13 of the medals were gold. And the rest was bronze and silver. 
But, you know, those are just the girls on the Olympic team. But every girl that came through his program and every girl that uh, stayed with it, you know, they graduated. He had like a 98% graduation rate. And then uh, those that did not graduate from Tennessee State, they went on to graduate from another school. So you can say it was 100%, but it was about 98%. I mean, for him to do that at a time when they were not, no one was doing anything like that for women. No, you know, not for black women, definitely. Speaking of those hard practices and- I'm sorry, um, speak a little louder, I can't. Speaking <laughs> of those hard practices and you getting beat in these practices, Mm -hmm. What was the camaraderie with with all the girls? What were the stories or the advice y'all were giving <laughs> each other or the motivation at the end of practices or during hard times or even good times? Well, one thing was, I also have to give Mr. Temple credit for, he was able to, his whole thing, he would always say the older girls you were to teach younger girls because you already been there, you've done these things, you know. You know, it was like we were, it was time to go on a trip. He was, you know, he would, your older uh, Tiger Bells would always come in and say, Okay, you have your clothes packed, do you have this right? Do you have this? Do you have all this thing? And, you know, the comrade, you know, the, I think we all got along. Okay, it's like a family. You know, you get a long day tomorrow, you may not, <laughs> you know, and, or then there's some people in the family that you're never going to be, you know, this tight, you know, but there was always, but the key was we always looked out for each other. That was the main thing. He would always say, you have to look out for each other. You have to take care of each other. And uh, those that know things that you need to share, you can't just sit there and hold it in. You need to share what you know. And, uh, and he made all of us feel that way that we, we, we were a family. We were a big family. We're all not going to be winners. We're all not going to get the same, you know. And they would always say, well, he had his favors. Okay. <laughs> so he had his favor. They say, they say, they say the same thing about a real, you know, your immediate family. You know, they say, this, you know, mom like you better, uh, dad like you better. So, so, but, you know, it was just a situation where Mr. Temple could do I don't think everybody could be under him because he, you know, he was, as I said before, very strict and he had uh, uh, old, some old antiquated ideas. But uh, if you just went along with it, just not even, he, what he didn't like is that if he's saying something, well, I don't know why I have to do this, why I have to do that, why he didn't care too much for that, you know. So, you try to tell the other young girls that come in, hey, if he said it, okay. As long as he's not doing anything to hurt you uh, and or saying things that make you feel really bad. Because if he make you feel bad, you have to tell him. <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, we understand that. But the key was that you don't always have to buck up to him just because you were used to a certain way of doing things and you come here and he said it has to be this way. You know, you, there's a way of getting around things. That's how I would always say. But now just, just talk about that a little bit more because you was, I mean, like you just said, 40 runners. I mean, you guys were dominant. I mean, the same, the same girls that you go to class with, the same girls that you're training with and going, y'all made up the Olympic team. Like we're not talking about y'all made up the Olympic sprint team. We're not talking about girls from all over the nation. Like you are all coming from the same place. What was that like? It was great. I mean, you, you know, like when we have time trials in, um, at school, they're, like the girls that were with Wilma, they were, that whole crew, they were talkers. They're like, okay, I'm getting first. You're getting second? <laughs> Today, they, they was back. that's how they were. Uh, when it came to, like, when I came in, uh, there was Edith McGuire, She's from Atlanta, and, and there is uh, about five other girls in that were there. And we were all, we weren't talkers like that. We just go out there and do what he said do. And they, you know, like Edith and I were best friends. And we had, we met, I was 15 and she was 16. That's when we met. And um, 
she when we went to Tokyo, you know, they had picked her to win three gold medals in in Tokyo, the hundred, the two hundred, and on the relay. And uh, we all and we already know that I won the hundred and he got second, but we're his best friends. We've been best friends since 15. We're still best friends. We talk almost every day or every other day. And people, what do you got to talk about? I don't know. Whatever comes up when we're talking. But uh, so, you know, you think about was there any arguments or all those kinds of things? Sure. You know, <laughs> of course, you know, like any family, you have arguments, you have disagreements. But when it came down to what you had to do on the track and what you had to do in school, we, we were all there for you. You know, you were there for each other. You know, if you having trouble in school, you need, as Mr. Temple would say, if you don't feel right, good talking to me, talk to one of your teammates, because I can guarantee you they've been there and they can help you with it. And the same thing. And if there's some rift between the Tiger Bells, that's, you know, you know they have to work it out because you're going to be with each other. <laughs> you know, <laughs> You, you know, most of the time, um, all of us, well, we had a Tiger Bell roommate, at least, at least one. You know, not all the time it's uh, three, uh, two Tiger Bells or three Tiger Bells in the room, because at that time it was three people to a roommate. But but uh, he was, um, so you have to learn to live in, in a big family. That's all it is. And, and he was able to negotiate that and navigate everything and make sure we all felt some comfortable when where we were. And if you didn't, you were having trouble, you could talk, you could talk to him. Also his wife, who was also a, a big supporter and helped us out too. And you know, she would make um for every girl on their birthday, he she would make these German chocolate cakes. Oh, they were look oh fabulous. So you know so it was a, a real family. So we you know it was Mr. Temple, his wife, he had two children and he had all of us. <laughs> you know, we always say uh, he likes to hang out with fast women. <laughs> <laughs> so now, I mean, you you were saying you were getting beat all the time. Well, so with all of that talent, when did you realize you were good? 64 at, at the Olympics in 64. It took that long? <laughs> yeah. Well, if you're getting beat and all those things, you, you know, you're not thinking about it. I mean, I was just thinking, I, I'm enjoying what I do. I enjoy, I mean, I don't enjoy getting beat, but I'm doing the best I can not to. I'm still getting beat. And I, you know, I I didn't think about all of that. I just, you know, I did enjoy it. And then like in 64, when I, Mr. Temple, I made the Olympic team. They take three people in each event. And I was the third person in 100 meters. So you see where I'm coming from. So when I made the Olympic team, and the good thing was Mr. Temple was a coach of the Olympic team in 64 for the women. He was a coach. And uh, so we went to Tokyo a month ahead of time. So we were over there a long time. And, and, and it's a lot of training. And, you know, we, got to, we also got to see Tokyo. We got to see, you know, learn about the culture of Tokyo. Of Japanese people, and then to go to the Olympic Games and live in an Olympic Village, and and where you have people from all over the world, and it was just fascinating to me, and that to see all these different people, to see it, hear the different languages being spoke, to see the different uh, uh, outfits they would wear from the different countries, the native uh, address, all of that, and also you had an opportunity to. Um, go into each dining hall that you would like to try and try the foods from those things. All these things were things for me that made me grow and made me learn so much about people and, and just see life a lot different. So just being in Tokyo and being on the Olympic team, I was just happy. That's what Mr. Shippo kept saying to me. Well, Tyus, all you have to do is just go ahead and do your best, and nobody expecting you to set the world on fire. We think you can do it. You know, we're looking at you for 68. I said, okay, Mr. Temple, sounds good to me. <laughs> so I had no pressure going into 64, and uh, I can remember in the 100 meters in each heat, I won every heat. And he said, when it came down to the finals, 
he came up and he, uh, I was working out, warming up for the hundred, and he came and talked. Ty, I just want to talk to you. I said, okay. And then he talked and he says, okay, I'm not expecting you to set the world on fire. You're looking good and now you look good in all your heats. If you can continue to run like that, you may be able to get a medal. I said, okay, thank you, Mr. Temple. And he walked away. And in my head, I'm like, get a medal. I can win. Then I said, but his whole thing was, you know, don't get the big head. Don't get the big head. Don't start thinking you can do all these things. And then I started saying to myself, oh, gosh, I'm getting the big head. I can't think like that. But, um, you know, and when they start for the final of the 100 meters, uh, Edith, my best friend, <laughs> was right next to me. And uh, the other girl from the U.S. was right next to her. So we were like in lane eight, seven, and six, and um, the gun went off, and I was running and running and running. I kept, I get about 80, say 70, 80 meters down the track, and I'm like, where is Edith? Because usually she catches me at 80 and passes me by, and I kept thinking, where could she be? And I, you know, you don't look around, you know, because if you look one way, they're passing you the other way. And all I kept thinking in my head and saying to myself over and over in my head that, hey, remember, lean at the tape, remember, stay relaxed, do these things. And then I could hear her. Edith was right, I could hear her. I said, oh gosh, here she is. And then it, the race was over. I didn't know, and then I, I, she was right there, so I didn't know right then that I had won. She's yelling, Tyus, you won, you won. I said, I did? And she says, yeah. It's okay. <laughs> so we were all very happy. <laughs> so I was going to ask, I'm sorry, I was just looking at it and you didn't seem to celebrate immediately. And so that's what I was going to ask was how did, what, did it kind of take a little time to wash over or whatnot? But I guess you didn't know whether no. or not you had truly won at the time. That's so true. Because I mean, I I guess so, you know, part of that being knowing your competition and knowing you have been nipped at the tape so many times. <laughs> and so it was more like, okay, uh, okay. And I would just, you know, I can just remember saying to myself when we got rid of, when we went up on a victory stand and, and got our medals and all that. And I kept thinking, gosh, Mr. Temple said, hey, 68 is my year. I got four more years. What am I going to do? <laughs> this, you know, but that's been 19 and you know kind of carefree you know that was that was how that was i mean i was not uh, nobody expected me to do anything so no pressure was on me the, the pressure was on my friend edith and that was about it so you saying you felt more pressure after you won it because i mean 64 this is right after wilma just dominated right mm -hmm. and now here you are the same ladies under the same coach coming from the same place you feel no pressure at all nope nope none whatsoever <laughs> mr temple coached that way well he coached me that way i get he was coach, you know because he never he always say you know everybody say you, you could be another wilma rudolph you could be this you could be that. you have to be yourself you know you're gonna be whatever you're gonna be you're not out there trying to be another wilma rudolph you're out there trying to do your best and come up with whatever you can come up with and I also was one of those people that never talked very much. So you're making me talk today. <laughs> but uh, I never talked very much and I kept to myself and all those kinds of things. So, you know, I was never one of those people that got all excited because this happened. You know, it's like, okay, I won. And then my mind immediately went to what Mr. Tupo had said prior 68 is your year. That's where I went, you know, and. Uh, but I still had an opportunity to enjoy my victory, especially when I went back to the uh, village and all those kinds of things. And, and people would say, God, you won. We saw you on TV. We saw you. And da, da, da. and other, you know, with people, other people were saying that was on a team. You beat your best friend. You and Edith. How y'all going to get along now? It has nothing to do with it. You know, once you line up on that track and they say, take your mark. I don't know who that who's. I don't know who's next to me. <laughs> After we broke the tape, it was we best friends again. There you go. So going on those same lines, after the win, 
um how did it change for you like you say you didn't really feel any additional pressure you just kind of were moving on to the next year but did life change in any way was it harder to go on campus was it people calling or people <laughs> always waving and honking coming by the dorms or stuff like that oh wow no not in the 60s though. <laughs> they didn't do all those kinds of things and also we were women so you know they weren't doing it we are women i should say they, they weren't doing anything like that. I mean, when we went back to Tennessee State, they we had a, you know, they made us at the airport have, have a huge, huge student body of people. A lot of them were there. And, you know, they did all that whole, you know, give you key to the city and all those kinds of things. And we go back because Edith and I are both from Georgia. We went back there and they gave us a parade in Atlanta. Uh, the thing, the killer about the whole parade in Atlanta, they give us a parade in Atlanta. And they had my mom and Edie's mom, both our parents were there because uh, Edie's father died earlier too. And so it was more, so they were, were all on the, on the floats, not the float, in the convertible car waving. And my parents and my mom and Edie's mom were just so happy to even be at a parade. So they never thought something like that would happen. And, and uh, we're going on and next thing we know, we're turning around and I'm like, what is going I didn't know what was going on. I found out later that um, they only took us to, well, you just told me, <laughs> they didn't take us through the whole city of Atlanta. They just took us through the black neighborhood in Atlanta. <laughs> so, so this is why I'm, you know, they, it was just not there. You know, you didn't, for me, I can't speak for other women, but for me, it was more like, I know what people, thought of me or as a black person and as a black woman, they're not gonna really give me all those accolades. Even, you know, we're here, this is the 60s and then we're in 2022 and we're still fighting for some of the same things. Yeah. Going back to uh, you saying the way, the coaching style that, that coach had for you, that you didn't feel any pressure. Mm -hmm. Uh, were there any times though that you had, especially with now there's a concerted uh, shine on mental health? Uh, was there any times you had like any doubts or, or just didn't feel like that was this was really your your stake? That besides when you were earlier and everybody was beating you when <laughs> when you were younger, then were there any while you were making your growth into track? Was there any times you were just doubting yourself or there were those type of, you know, negative thoughts creeping or negative feelings creeping in at any point? I think I was, I mean, I look back at my life. I mean, I, after my father passed away, I was, you know, I mean, talking about going into a shell and not talking. I mean, I was in the one word answers and things like that. So I really had trouble with that in my my mom would always say to me, look, you have, you can't keep being like this. Your dad wouldn't want this. Your dad wouldn't want to see this. So, but it was not like my, I was going go to see someone to talk about my problems. And, and not only that, growing up then, you are, you know, you don't tell anybody your problems. You know, you know, you know yes, those were things that was, you know, you just never got an opportunity to, uh, no one came up and say, hey, what's going on? Nobody ever thought about that. And I, don't, I mean, they, if they did, they never said it to me. The only thing Mr. Temple used to say when I went to college is, you need to learn to talk. <laughs> you talk. These one word answers can't help. That's not going to help you. You're going to be interviewed. You need to learn to say more things and all of that. And I still did. It still, even in 64, it didn't happen. I mean, it was after 64. And I just think after that and just getting older, wise of being exposed to a lot of things made me uh, talk a little bit more. But by the time I was 68, you know, I was talking a lot, a lot more, but that wasn't saying much. <laughs> but, but yeah, I, you know, it just, I just, I don't know. I was, I, I think, you know, you have people, uh, athletes that are uh, talkers, you have them that are non-talkers, you have the ones to just, just you know, bide their time and do what they have to do. And and I was always just happy with anything I accomplished. And it didn't always have, it didn't have to be winning. 
you know, because I just felt like hey, I have I've had an opportunity to do something I never thought I would do. I have an opportunity to travel all over the world. I, have, I have, you know, I, I I was always bubbly inside with that in my head, thinking, look what I have, what I could I got, and look at the education I got, and not just. I got a college education. I got a worldly education. I got to be able to, you know, as Mr. Temple used to tell the whole our team all the time, you know, you, you just can't, he would always say, you just can't have track friends or athletes, just be with athletes all the time. You need to have friends with all from all different walks of life. And so, you know, because that teaches you something, it teaches you to grow. And, you know, and that, and, and I, you know, these are kind of things that, um, you know, a coach like I mean, for Mr. Temple to be able to say that and give his girls that kind of uh, advice to say, you know, you can't. It's okay to have athletes as your friend and teammates as your friend, but it should not be out. He always said, you need to find people much smarter than you. <laughs> you know, so they can you can see how they do things, and and that's how you learn. I mean, it's like kids, you know, how they learn, they watch and they see things, and that's how that works. And he was able to coach his girls and have us believe, believe in, you know, being all that. And then he had, girl, you know, he had Wilma, who was a talker, <laughs> you know, she was a talker. And, uh, you know, she, as he would always say, she never met a stranger. You know, she, she if she was here, she would, you all know, you feel like you were part of her, you know, because that's how she was. And, you know, it pays, off to have different kinds of friends and people that have different attitudes about things and expose you and help you learn and grow. So now you 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 win in 64, you set the world record. Mm -hmm. And now you're coming up on 68 and you said this is the time when everybody expected you to win now. This is your turn. Yes. But of course in 68 of course we know the nation's in turmoil. Right, Dr. King had just been assassinated. Mm -hmm. You had the, um, the 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 riots at the DNC. Mm -hmm. You had an election coming up, and here you are representing a nation in turmoil at a sporting event that promotes peace. So, what is your mindset going into the '68 Olympics? Like, what are you thinking to yourself? Well, my goal for '68 was that I would graduate from college, which I did before I went to the Olympics and that uh, to go to the Olympics and to win the 100 meters uh, and to be the first person ever to do those kinds of things. That was my goal. And uh, it was, like you said, it was a lot of turmoil, a lot of things that were going on in the, in the world. I mean, even on the campus of Tennessee State, there was all of that. I mean, at Stokely Carmichael was there and, and he, you know, he spoke on campus and uh, then they the students started to go out into the streets and, and I, you know, Tennessee State sitting in a little area. It was just Jefferson Street and there's Tennessee State on each side of that. So it was not in a city of uh, Nashville. And students were marching up and down the street. The next thing we know, uh, they had brought in the National Guards brought in the armies and tanks on campus. Now, this is, we're not downtown tearing up anything. <laughs> They're just walking in the middle of the street of Jefferson Street and doing, and oh, they came in and shut Tennessee State down. I mean, you could not go off campus, you couldn't do nothing. Those are the kinds of things. And it's just more, it, those things were happening. Other things were happening. They were also talking about not going to the Olympic Games because and, and boycotting and all, all those kinds of things were going on. They were talking about that. No one was talking to us as women. I can tell you that about uh, boycotting and not going. This was all that was happening on the West Coast, which is California, and it has happened in San Jose State. So, uh, we did only we we would get the any information about what was happening as far as the boycott or not going to the games is that reporters would call Mr. Temple and say, uh, this is being said, are your girls gonna go along with this? Are your girls <laughs> we don't know anything about it, we can't go along with it. First of all, we have not been, you know, well, can we talk to them? And he said, You think we can, I can go get them out of class? I said, Nope, you can't. 
we don't do that here. They have they have education they have to get, and uh, you know, no one at the people that were uh, at San Jose State, you know, those that where it was started at, nobody ever called us. Nobody ever said this is what we're planning to do. Oh, you're going to join us? They just took for granted. If we say it, you're going to do it, and. and that's uh, I've always looked at it that way, and I've never been that type of person. <laughs> so my well, thing. That's why I was getting ready to ask you. So, if you had been eggs, would you have boycotted, or were you considering boycotting once you became aware of it? Well, the thing was, uh, the other part of this is that I always say, first you have to make the team, and then you can talk about boycotting. You can talk about boycotting all you like. If you're not on the team, you're not going anyway. So, <laughs> so. I always said that let's make the tea and let's decide. Let's see what we're going to do then. Uh, but again, it comes down to being in the Olympic Village if the people who made the team and all that, and talking about it. And what can we do as a group of people and as you know, as a group as athletes? And it's just not black people. It's just not the black athletes. Let's say that it was also other. It was white athletes. Entire the. Was that Harvard rowing team was a part of the whole movement and all that. So it was a lot of people that was involved, but nobody knew what they were going to, what we, what we could do. How could you protest? And we had several meetings, and no one. Then it got to the point where hey, each person has to do what they want to do, and that's you know that's how it was left up to it. You do what you want to do. If you want to, not you know, once you're there. You're going to participate or you're not. Or if you're going to participate, you want to, and after you race or after you compete, you want to protest, that's up to you. You have to make the decision. But there was no uniform dis decision made with that. You know, each person had to do whatever. They wanted. Yes, ma'am. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right. Now, one of the most iconic things about your 68 Olympics yeah. uh, for you in you know, just, uh, you know, repeating as the champion mm -hmm. was a pre-race uh, routine uh, before the final. Mm -hmm. uh, performed a very popular dance at the time uh, <laughs> from an artist that's near and dear to my heart, Houston, Texas, <laughs> Archie Bell and the Drill. Right. Uh, can you um, just tell us uh, what that did for you? And uh, can you sort of give us sort of a, an idea of uh, how popular that song was and how recognizable <laughs> that might have been to all the people watching? Well, you know, and Archer Bell and the Drills, I mean, being in college at that time and all the dances that were out and they would, there was a dance called the Titan, you know, the, uh, the Titan up. And so, <laughs> and um, I was, uh, to saying to uh, Ralph Boston, who is also from Tennessee State, and he was on the Olympic team, and he made he won a gold medal in the long jump in 1960 in Rome, got a silver medal in Tokyo, and got a bronze medal in Mexico City. So I was telling him, I, I was, uh, he was always like a big brother to us as Tiger Bells. He was like a big brother. So he was, we were talking, and I was just saying, I think it was the night before, the day before, I can't remember the hundred, and I just told him, you know, you know what I think I'm going to do? I'm going to do the tighten up in front of my blocks before I run. It's all I tie us now, because yeah, every, you know, I tie. I said, okay, I am. So that's the only person I said something to. I never said anything to anybody else. Right? But for me, going into 68, it was a year where some, all my, I, you know, I had had a bad year to year before <laughs> and, uh, when I said, I mean, to the point where Mr. Temple thought, oh, I don't know if you're going to make the Olympic team. I had gotten um, a spider bite on one leg and then I was at, uh, at a campfire and somebody threw paper on us and that burned on the other leg. So I was out of commission for a while there. And uh, when I did come back, Mr. Temple said, I don't think you... You just look so bad. You just look horrible. And so it was the Pan American Games, and he kept saying, "Well, I don't think you should go because you look so bad. You need to go back to practice. Go back to Tennessee State with me, and we just work on it." And I knew about his practices, and I said, "No, Mr. Temple, I I can do this. I can do this. Just let me 
No, because I had really bad running the hundred meters. Matter of fact, I did, I did, I, did, I got fourth or fifth in the hundred. And so he said, you know, I ain't gonna be on a be on a relay team because of you, you know, you ran so bad. I was a, you know, it was a 200. I had to run a 200. And I was like, he said, well, you don't even like that. So I don't even know why you want to embarrass yourself. Why would you go out there and do this? This is at the Pan American Games. And I said, just let me do it. I just feel like I, I can do this. I can do it. And he let me run the 100, I mean, the 200 meters. And I won the 200 in the, for the Pan American Games, which was great. And, uh, and he's, you know, and then, you know, when I went back to, you know, for the games for Tokyo, I mean, Tokyo, Mexico City, everybody was talking about, oh, even reporters, oh, oh she's too old. I was all the 23, <laughs> but I was too old to be running. <laughs> I should, you know, I need to give it up and all these young kids going to do that. And my goal in life at that time was, um, I'll show them what old is. <laughs> and uh, and that's how, I, but, uh, you know, I, that was just in me. And then, uh, when it came down to the 100 meters and I won in the different heats and went through and came for the final. And I said, oh, you know, I have nothing to lose here. Because it was nothing in my whole psyche, in my whole body feeling that anybody else could beat me. Yeah, I, you know, I, I just felt that. I just felt it was my time that was going to be me. I, I wasn't stepping up to the line going, who's getting second, like a lot of the, <laughs> some of the other Tiger Bills would have said. <laughs> but I was feeling that. And then, you know, and in doing so, I started, I did that little dance called the Tighten Up. It was also to help psych out my opponents a little bit. <laughs> and already, <laughs> I think, too, they were... And also, you think about the fact that I had won in four years prior, and I had come here just four years later, and they, and that's a hard, that had never been done. So, you know, I wasn't looking at so much it's never been done. I just looked at, I'm going to do it. <laughs> that's how I looked at it. And I went on to win it, and but doing that tighten up in front of my blocks. I've even had athletes come up and say from another country, what was that strange dance you were doing? It psyched me out. Good. <laughs> it did its job. I did my job. I did my job. <laughs> so absolutely. So now you're there. You 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 have an idea. You know what you're doing now. You know, like you say, you have your confidence back. You mm -hmm. you feel like you're the best in the world. Um, and then of course we know six to eight is famous for the 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 Tommy Smith and John Carlos protest but you had a little bit of a protest of your own what made you decide to do what you did the way that you did it well as i said stated earlier is that you know i said each athlete wanted to do something they had to come up with something they wanted to do and i you know i never thought about what i wanted to do i decided i think in um the first day of competition the first race i was in you know we all we all have to we always have to wear uniforms and that first race i was in i had on uh, the whole uniform and then i decided i'm not going to do this my way of my protest and my way of showing solidarity to what i believe in and showing as i'm going to wear my black shorts so i had black shorts and i wore my black shorts and people always say, well, well what did they say? Because you have to stay in uniform. I said, I'm, first of all, they didn't even look at women. <laughs> they didn't say what we had on. <laughs> you know, anything, because they let you know they did not even understand it. And then every, in that now, you know, that's what everybody said. It was a silent protest. For me, I, I just spoke to volume so <laughs> for me. But it, it, it's, that was OK. I wasn't doing it. But it was my way of showing solidarity with what I believe in and what was what I believe that we as a world of the country and especially with the Olympics, they always talk about there's no politics, it's always politics and politics. <laughs> yes. So as you were, you told us about the reception you got uh in sixty-four when mm -hmm. it moved to the black area of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. How was it any different after 68? Did they give you a little bit bigger uh, reception or 
But not in Atlanta, you know, even in 64, that's what happened in Atlanta. They, they, but when I went to Griffin, which is 40 miles south of Atlanta, my hometown, in 64, they gave me a big parade in, in my hometown. And then, uh, and then in 68, the same thing. And in my hometown, they also have built a park in my honor called the Wyoming Atias Olympic Park. It's 168 acres. It has, uh, they say it's a lake, I call it a pond, and you get can fish, and they have walking trails, soccer fields, pickleball, if you know anything about pickleball. Yes, uh, that's, okay, they, uh, they have uh, 15 pickleball courts at the park, and they have frisbee stuff, they have a whole lot, it's really, I'm, I was really shocked uh, that my hometown would you know it would do that for me i was just so because they had said um when they told me they were going to do the park and they dedicated the park uh some of the people that were on their board that came up had come up to me and said look we didn't do enough for you or we didn't do really right by you in 64 but you know we're in 68 so this is what they they give me a park and it's fabulous they, uh, they now they put a big marquee up there that says, "Well, they tie us Olympic Park and have me, and and winning in six to eight. So <laughs> that's good. It's not so small of a town anymore, huh? No, it's not. It's <laughs> it's pretty big now, but yeah, yeah. Well, I got a question real quick. I'm sorry, dog. Uh, going back to the protest. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of going then and then looking forward. Kind of piggybacking off what you say, it's always politics. How do you feel now about the fact that a lot of athletes are kind of, not a lot, I'll just say some athletes are shying away from that, um, using their platform in order to make a change. Um, I would say they're saying the major difference is that the issues now that they're, the main issues are away from America as opposed to in America. Mm -hmm. um, but as we all know, there's always obviously issues in America all the time. Yeah. So how do you feel kind of about that kind of apolitical stance that a lot of athletes are taking now or were taking, I would say, prior to this last couple of years? Well, I, my thoughts on those is that, you know, every person I said it earlier, and I don't know that my I belief is everybody's not on the same page at the same time. And when you're not on the same page, you can't be upset with, well, you can, but you have to also find a way in letting them know, maybe you look, look at things differently and all that. Stuff. And if you see that you can't do that, you just have to move on and that person has to grow. That to me is all about growth and it's all about uh, learning and uh, paying attention to what's going on. How does this affect you and how is this gonna affect if you have children or you have uh, nieces and nephews or whatever, if you if you're not speaking up for things that are right, the things that you could help things, and I mean everybody and everybody is not able to do that. Every, you know, and I you have to do that. We are all individual. We you know we expect people to be on the day. Hey, if this is so real, everybody know this. This needs to change. That doesn't make everybody right there. So you just can't count them out. You try to figure out a way. How can you bring them in? How can and maybe they may not be as strong as you about what your how you feel about the pro protesting and all that. But if you can just get them to start changing or start to look at things a lot a little different. But you know, and if you can't, you know, you can't. You have to continue. You have to go on. You have to go. You have to go to the ones that you can. You know, and uh, and. I, I just never have um, felt that you needed to, I needed to uh, badger someone because they didn't think the way I thought or they weren't doing the things that I did. Because I always think about where I was when I was younger, where I was in 64. And because I was exposed to so much, to, I was exposed to so many different cultures, so many different people and how they live, how they think. I went and had an opportunity to be a goodwill ambassador to go to Africa to see all these. And these kinds of things that changed a lot of my thoughts and made me just 
speak out about things and feel, and they were always in here, but then I felt comfortable enough to speak out about it, talk about it. And I think that's where we have to be. You know, some people just not there. And some of them, and also we're not going to get to everybody. That's, you know, that's, that's, that's just reality. We know that. Uh, but you you spend your time where you think it's very wise, the one that's going to help. And if that person is still there and, and they keep listening, who knows? You know? And hopefully in time with age and exposure, they will come to that side. Now, looking over the years from the turmoil of when you came up, now the empowerment of women now uh how how what in your perspective how do you see it well we still have a long way to go <laughs> i just you know i i feel that women have gotten a lot a lot has changed i mean i you think about when i was competing and i grew up with being told by relatives and everybody else that Hey, girls are not supposed to have muscles. A man is not going to want you to have muscles. You need to learn how to do these. You need to learn how to be a good cook, a good wife. And I'm my, and my dad, that was, was a man that said, you can be anything you want to be. You can be best to whatever you want to do. So I had that at a very early age. And I think with women, it's the same. I think, you know, we're talking, I grew up in the 50s and the 60s, and here we are in 2022. And uh, we're still, to me, still at that point where women still have to prove themselves over and over and over and over again. And even in doing so, it's not, you know, you still don't get the accolades or get the recognition, but you can't stop. You can't, you know, like I said too earlier, that you have to stay in the fight. And when you're staying in the fight, that's not physically so much, unless you have to. <laughs> but uh, the staying in the fight is still believing in you and believing in what you want to do and knowing that uh staying in the fight for your dignity staying in the fight for other people that cannot speak for themselves these are the, this is what it is all about and i for me this is what has made me and this is how i have grown over the years from all my exposure to everything that i from growing up on the dairy farm to go into all the you go into two olympic games and traveling all over the world so it's made you know these are the kinds of things and i feel and you have to feel comfortable in speaking out and talking so you also those are the kind of things that sometimes when you're caught up in hey you need to be here you need to do this and all that you know and that person is not there when you think they should be you know you have to kind of walk them through it a little slower and you know give them that space uh, that's important i think you know because you know, we keep turning the page. And so hopefully they could, you know, be a speed reading, catch up. <laughs> so. <laughs> so now come, so now coming into today, mm -hmm. um, what do you think about today's athletes, the performances of today's athletes, today's runners, today's women's runners? What do you think about some of the times and, and, and <laughs> of course, um, Track and field has has had its issues with performing <laughs> enhancing drugs. Yes, was was that ever an issue when you were running? Um, and if and if and if so, how was that dealt with compared to what do you think about now and its continual issues that it's having now? Well, when I was running, as far as uh, the women that ran against uh, at Tennessee State and maybe track meets. Well, you know, we're not taught, we weren't, uh, we didn't know anything about it. I'm going to put it, I didn't know anything about anybody using drugs at the time. I mean, they, there were rumors of certain uh, athletes that may have been mainly the ones that were in the weight events and stuff like that, but never say on the sprint field. I didn't, it never came across. I mean, you know, People, I don't know, everybody want to be, you can't all be on the top <laughs> and you can't win all the time. And, and maybe it is easy for me to say because I have done it, but all I say to the athletes is that you can't always, I mean, you do your best and you have to be, I always feel you have to feel, be okay with that in your heart and, 
and your whole thinking. And a lot of times people feel like, hey, if I do this, I may not get caught. But then you do. <laughs> there are, or maybe something else bad could happen to you. I have no idea. I just know I don't see there's a need for it. I feel like if you, but a lot of times people say, oh, that person is uh, doing this, running that fast or jumping that high or all those kinds of things because they're on drugs. They feel that they're on drugs. It doesn't mean that they aren't. But, you know, it's a whole lot of things. And and we are in a part of, at a part of society now that thinks you got to be better than everybody. <laughs> you got you got to put up the numbers. You got to put up the stats. You got to you know you, you got to stand out. You know, and um, people do things to do that. You know, it's not just you know athletics. It's in all at the workplace, every place. You know, you know, people do those things, and uh, does it make it right? No, for me it doesn't. But you know, for them it does. I can't. I don't try to speak for what they do. I just say it's not for me. It shouldn't be for, you know, and, and not all that. It's so many people get caught anyway. So what do you do? <laughs> what do, you do? Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> one of the, the problems there going on and with it a little bit more. Um, one of the issues that I have with it is, is that it's a historical thing. So there are records, there are events. You're, you particularly, you set a record that was beaten mm -hmm. if you had a record that was beaten by someone who was i guess doing it fraudulently mm -hmm. um illegally however you want to put it or enhancedly let's say um how does that make you feel how would that make you feel do you feel slighted do you just say like each is on or this is the <laughs> day it is now how does that make you feel? it would upset me that's why i'm asking so now, it doesn't accept me because, see, I always look at records and they're there to be broken, whether the person is taking drugs or not. Somebody's going to break the record. It's not going to stay there, you know, and uh, that's I always look at it that way. And uh, so, you know, other people, they don't. They say, oh, God, I did this. I did that. OK, they did. But it, and I guess for me, it's like. The things I've done uh, is for me to went back to back 100 meters and for people not to even know it. And if and they say when Carl Lewis does it, they all on television, even the sports guys, he's the first person that does this. I mean, now that makes me feel bad. <laughs> something like, you know, something of that nature. Right, but, so, right, you know, so. see, but, you know, I but records are there to be broken. I mean, it's like everything else is like. Everything, I mean, if you think, I think about like living in Georgia and living on a dairy farm, I didn't want to live that in my life. I want to move on up. <laughs> I want, but I wanted to do the things that I needed to do the way that my parents had raised me to do them. Okay. You know, but uh, the drugs, I don't know what to say to them if that's that. You're not gonna be able to ride that out forever, so you you're gonna get caught in that There's somewhere along the line. And also, the Olympic Committee and all those people, they also need to come up with some better uh, rules and all those kinds of things. I mean, they're you know sometimes it's like a yeah, this person do it and this, ah, you can't do it because we don't care too much for you, so to speak. You know, so they need to come up with some rules that. Uh, fits today's generation, fits whatever is going on. They, they are, you know, that's, and not just put a Band-Aid on it and then later the Band-Aid fall off and we have all this other stuff that's going on that's not right. And you have people upset and they upset. And they should be, but still, if you're a person that's in charge and making, and you're not the one person, there's several of you out there that are making these decisions. You need to be a lot smarter than that. And also, they, they need to bring in some athletes to help them, if that's the case. <laughs> so now switching gears, because you I, I, it's so many questions I could ask about that, but I'm like, nah, let's leave that alone. Switching <laughs> gears. You wrote a book. I did. What made you decide to do that? I, well, <laughs> I never thought that I had anything to say, <laughs> or yeah, first of all, and I never thought that, uh, you know, and the person, uh, Elizabeth, who's my co-writer, uh, when I first talked to her, she 
was like, you have a lot to say. You know, I didn't, you know, we were just had a regular conversation and she said, your story is a story that needs to be told. And I was like, yeah, sure. All these years and nobody wanted to hear my story. I mean, not only that, they didn't want to hear my story. They don't even give me the right part of the story. They don't give me the all the those kinds of things. I don't feel like fighting that. I don't want to, you know, I'm at a stage of my life. I'm enjoying who I am, where I am in my life. And I don't want to be all these other things. And she says, but people need to know your story. And I'm just happy to this day that I did let her convince me to write the book. And to me, it was for, you know, just to let people know it doesn't matter where you come from or how little you have or anything like that. It's about, you know, you doing you and you being happy with who you are. And I like to think that's what my book is about it. It's called Tiger Bell, the Wyoming Tie Story. It talks about me, but the other part of it, the main part of the reason I want to talk about it was because of Mr. Temple. Here's a man that has never got his due. And he never, and he's passed on now. And he used to always say, you know, give me my flowers while I'm alive, where I can smell them. <laughs> and I just felt that here's a man that's done all this for black women and for uh, Tennessee State University. If, if we were any other color, what would happen? How would he be recognized? He would still be recognized. And to, you know, to put all these women on the Olympic team, to make sure every one of his girls graduated, whether they went to the Olympics or not, he made sure everybody graduated from college. He made it sure of that. And, you know, uh, you think in 1960, the whole relay team in 1960 for the women were all from Tennessee State University. In 1964, there is three of us from Tennessee State. It was Edith McGuire, uh, myself, Willie White. Willie White started out at Tennessee State, but she and Mr. Temple bought pairs, so she left. <laughs> but you know, but she went on to graduate and then from an, another school, and she went on to you know, be on five Olympic teams. And so she was on the 64 with the, and then you come in 68 and you have me winning the 100 meters and, and then you ha had Matlin Manning uh, and, and that the win at 800 meters, the first time a uh, American woman has ever won a gold medal in, that 100, in 800 meters. And, uh, and it just happened in the last Olympics for somebody else to do it. Another, but, you know, these kinds of things that, so I wanted to really honor him. It was my way of honoring him and writing the book. And, uh, and I always say now, see, Mr. Temple, I do talk. So it's in the book. <laughs> and I, so, so that's why I wrote the book for that. And if it could inspire anybody. And I just don't think my book is just for girls. <laughs> I think it is it's because it's mainly about who you are as a person and what you believe in, how you fight for what your belief is. And uh, so that's why I wrote the book. How's the reception been on it? It's been good. Uh, need to be more. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, it's still selling. I mean, the book came out in eight, into, uh, 2018 and it's still selling. So that's good. So when people are watching, go out and buy it. You know, you can get it still from Amazon. All right. So why don't we tie a story? Tiger Bells. <laughs> I got a question. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, why do you think he had um, he didn't get the the credit or not the credit? I'm sorry. He. Why do you think your coach didn't get Crazy. any credit? Because like I literally had to Google. Like <laughs> had no idea. I had heard about the school and their prowess, but I didn't know the dominance. Mm -hmm. And then to see that it all comes back to him. Not only that, there, like you said, there were several of them that left and mm -hmm. still were cold or good and made it to the Olympics and stuff. And I gotta attribute that to him as well. All right. So what do you think? What do you think it was about Mr. Temple that was that what did he just have an eye or was did he have a plan or just the <laughs> training or what do you think it was? I was I just you know, I still marvel at the fact that he could see it. How he how did he see that this, you know, how did he know Wyoming ties with a I was I was getting third and fourth when he saw me run, but he saw something in me that 
the people that were beating me, he didn't invite, but he invited the third. Of, you know, so I, he just he had that eye, and he had that. And to me, you know, I, it took it takes or it took a certain kind of person to be on the Musa Temple to you know, have him coach you because you know he, he he you know he never was a person that was short for words, and he always spoke his words and said things that sometimes he would say things and well why did you have to say that <laughs> you know <laughs> but he would but that was him and you learn that but I just don't know why I don't know why people well I don't think I know why I mean why well, I don't know why they would not give him all the credit because you know you talk you think about the basketball you know like a John Wooden you know come on to me Mr. Temple is that and more as no, I was thinking with Gino yeah, yeah. or Emma, any other coach that would put an entire team in any kind of like this would be handball, mm -hmm. like lacrosse, like anybody put an entire team that consecutive, that would be yeah, history and breaking was, 30 for 30 type stuff, usually. So he's had girls on the team from 1956 to 1980. Probably longer than that, because um, Matt LeMann was running. You know? So he's had people. I mean, I don't know. I mean, we know and we don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, it's, but I don't labor on the fact that, that I just, you know, my contribution is writing the book and letting people read and know these things and let them look at that and think about, hmm, why is that? Like, you know, like you were saying, hmm. <laughs> so, why haven't they talked about why don't they talk about him? Why haven't they talked about him? Why I mean Nashville, I mean the people in Nashville have talked about him. I mean, he got a big old brown statue and everything in Nashville. But you know, you cannot speak on track and feel about women without talking about him. It's just no way, you know, just no way to have to help people. And then you know, everybody's oh they were all sprinters. No, he had people, and not only that. He had a lot of girls, uh, well, from uh, Panama, Bermuda, uh, Bermuda uh, so yeah, Jamaica. He's had all those girls that come through here. Got Tennessee State, got an issue. Those things. They didn't want the U.S., but they ran the U.S., their country. But still, they went to Tennessee State and got the issue. Yes, ma'am. Uh, can you tell us uh, what makes a quality track coach? Um, are there some specific uh, criteria uh, that you can say? Because we talk about a lot of, you know, we talk about what makes a good coach and a lot of other things. But what makes a good track coach? What kind of tactical things do they teach you? Is it all training? Um, is the training the most important thing? Are there tactical things that they can teach you? Well, the, the, what makes, to me, a good coach or you know, track coach, the fact that, that you understand who you, your talent, you understand who you have, you understand, and uh, you give them the opportunity to grow. You show them if you do these things, this can happen. Uh, you make sure, like for us, Mr. Temple was always that, hey, you, you have to graduate. You're not, it's no, if I graduate, no, you're going to graduate. <laughs> You know, we you're gonna work your buns off, and we you're gonna be have be tutored, and you're gonna do these things. Uh, so, a good track coach is knowing your, who you have, giving them um, good instructions of not just about on being on the track, but uh, as much as you can about life and how life is, and having them set goals to where they want to go and where they want to be, and uh, if things aren't going right for they need to speak up, they need to speak out, you know. Uh, you know, so, the, you know, the whole thing is that you need to make the athlete aware that there are so many things out there that they may not know about because either they haven't been exposed to it, they're too young, or they've been exposed to it and they're just tired of it or whatever. You have to get, and you have to keep them motivated. You know, you have to keep them motivated. And I think that's one of the hardest things, too, to keep them motivated. And and you can't try to help them to understand just because somebody is running a great time or throwing a discus so far and you have not been able to do that. 
doesn't mean you're not good. It just means that, hey, you know, maybe <laughs> you will come. Like for me, it was like, I was I good. I was getting beat every day. And then 64, I, I blossomed. <laughs> and it was because of uh, him co coaching also just learning and becoming stronger and understanding who I am as an individual and help a person to do that. And also let them know, hey, make sure the athlete know that, hey, if you're struggling with something, don't hide it. <laughs> Share it with someone. You know? And it's as simple as all that. It's like, you know, I think about uh, when we would go on trips and stuff like that. He would always, whoever you go with, you come back with. If you go that, if you go out and partying or whatever, whoever you go with, you come back with. You don't ever leave anybody behind. You always, and you know, it was like he would always tell us too about when we we had an athletic trainer. When you wanted to get a rub down, you could not just go in and get a rub down. It always had to be two people together. You don't leave your partner. You know, you say, all those kind of things are safe things to keep. You know, and that's what he said and that's what he promised our parents that he would keep us safe and uh, it may have been the old-fashioned way and sometimes you didn't like it but it kept us safe and that's what it was all about and I think that's what coaches have to understand you have these are not your children it's somebody else's children and you know you got to make them feel comfortable when you have to make them and they're not going to always be kids they're not going to be young they got to grow up and they you know, they need to feel good about who they are and who they were as a young person and uh, growing up to be a, an adult and help them with understanding. And it may not be the coach that can do it, but have somebody there to help them with it, you know? Well, we talked about Coach Temple and his great dominance and all this comes from HBUs and the the dominance of HBUs. There's been a mini resurgence in top athletes going back to HBUs. What is your perspective on what the HBUs bring to an athlete of our color? Mm -hmm. And if it's best that our athletes start going back to the HBUs to get their education and their and their preparation for life? Well, you know, things change. We all grow. This world is growing. I mean, like, we would be, we definitely don't want to see things as they were when I was growing up. So, so, and uh, it's kind of like, I think of um, oh, what, Title Nine, women, you know, they, that passage of Title Nine and what Title Nine done for, did for women and all of that. And, and it's still doing for women, but it still needs help and needs people to be aware of it. And I think, when, you know, it when it Title IX passed, one thing that happens with uh, the HBC school, especially in track, I mean, you know, nobody wanted to go to Tennessee State if I can go to UCLA. <laughs> you know, good weather if I can go to USC, if I can go, you know, those kinds of things. So, you know, those... Um, you know, you, you want you want growth. You're gonna have to have growth, and uh, I, I'm just happy to see their athletes are considering and is, are going back to the HBCU school, and they're getting money. and And, and the schools need money, and they're <laughs> and uh, we're learning that uh, a lot of these schools didn't get the money that was promised to them. When other universities right there got it, and they did not, so. They are bringing, I think that, and I think the fact that, um, you know, you get people talking more and understanding, hey, and, and in the HBC school, they, you have to, you think about if I'm at a big school, I'm going to get seen and people are going to want to have me on that team. When I, I can go pro real quick, I'll, uh, people know who I am. And, and if they're not at that, and say if they're, a small school, that's not, they don't feel it's going to happen. But they see now it is happening. It's not happening as fast as we like, but it is happening. People are taking more now, uh, notice of it. And, uh, you know, so maybe things will change. You know, we're going back to how it used to be. <laughs> I, 
and because there's enough talent out there and there's enough uh, athletes out there to go to any school and all schools and, and it, they all could be great. And then, and also the HBC schools don't have to get more money to in order to compete with the other schools. It's, you know, the, the, the equipment room, the trainers, the this and that, you know, the, that's a whole, and, and we, the people that go and graduate from HBC schools also have to give back. You have to give back to the schools because uh, if you're not giving back, because that's how these big schools, they, they got the people graduating, maybe they didn't play any sports, but they in a position where they can donate so much money back. So we have to get people to always, you know, those are the kinds of things that needs to you happen. Think it is, do you think they are inherently better for African American students or students of color, or because that's their major, not their major, because that's the major thing I hear most. I didn't go to one, so mm -hmm. that's the major thing I hear most is just that it's a better environment, it's more conducive, more people that understand you feel the same way, blah 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 blah. Do you agree to that? Do you prescribe to that, or do you think that that could be done in other places, or that that I guess it just depends on the time in this place? Well, I, you know. I just don't think we should try and take education from anybody where they ever want to go. If they want to go to a big 10 school, they don't want to go to that. I think that uh, I have always felt that I got the best education. It's like even growing up and I was, you know, I never, my schools, my high school, my, from, well, I didn't go to school with white kids. So I, got, I felt I got, the best education going. I mean, they were always, you know, you had that that situation where people were looking after you all the time and you felt that, you felt that. But that's not to say it doesn't happen at the larger schools either. You know, and my, it's just so many. And sometimes you, you get lost in that. And they are like at Tennessee State. I mean, when I was in school, there were about 1,500 students. So, you know, that was it. Uh, so you feel more at that time. It was I came from a little close environment, and then that you know, and then people that grow up in an environment where they've been exposed to a whole lot of stuff and being around the top ten schools or all of those kinds of things, they feel a couple. You may feel more comfortable there. I don't know. So now. You are also a founder. Yeah, wait, how long are we talking? <laughs> I'm, I'm probably wrapping it up. I told you, you just you you got so many things going on. So now you are also the founding a founding advisory board member of the Women's Sports Foundation. Mm -hmm. So now, what exactly is that, and what what made you become a part of that? <laughs> but it, well, the Women's Sports Foundation is basically one that got. Title IX started. That's basically what that happened. That, right, because that's what I said. You mentioned Title IX, so that's what yeah. made me go ahead and ask. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the Women's Sports Foundation. It started with a uh, few women that were talking at uh, an event, and we see each other all the time at these events, and we would and we sit at, at, at with the banquet circuit, so to speak, and the people would talk. Uh, Parents would say, hey, gosh, I wish I knew that I could run track. I wish I knew I could have done this. I wish I could. I wish I would like for my daughter to have this and that's that. So we kept hearing that. And we were just, we all got, it was about eight of us that was talking once. And we started meeting. And there we go. There we have Title IX. <laughs> and, you know, they pushed for, hey, equal rights. You know, women, girls should have equal rights and all that. And, you know, and be okay with who, who they are and competing and it's being good at what they're, and, and being told they're good and being happy with that. Absolutely. Well, Miss Wildman, we thank you so much. <laughs> yes, stopping by the garage department. You have no idea how bad and how honored we are to have you. Um, again, we want to thank you for all the many things that you have done. Uh, we all have, well, I was going to say we all have daughters, but that's not true. We all are fathers and some of us have daughters. And <laughs> so the things that you have done, the, the blows that you have, have made for the equality of, of girls and women in sports, 
um, is unmeasured, it is invaluable. And so we thank you and we are completely honored for you to stop by. Uh, um, go ahead and let everyone know how can they get your book again? What is the name of it? How can they get it? It's called uh, the Wyoming Tires, uh, called Tiger Bell, the Wyoming Tires Story. And you can get it from Amazon. And it's a great gift for any boy, girl, older adults, all of that. It's great. It's great reading. <laughs> Absolutely. And thank you again for everything. It was a complete honor. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Have a great one. All right. Bye bye. Follow the Garage Apartment on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Brand new tweet, photos, videos, hashtags. Let me share some real quick. Follow me on social media. And subscribe to the Garage Apartment Radio on YouTube.